Signal Sciences is the industry's first web protection platform that works in any cloud, any container, any platform as a service, and any modern application architecture. The Signal Sciences web protection platform can be deployed in next generation WAF, RASP, or reverse proxy modes, giving customers ultimate flexibility and coverage. Protect your web applications with Signal Sciences web protection platform. Signal Sciences, protecting applications, connecting teams. For more information, check them out at signalsciences.com forward slash PSW. The average time between being hacked and realizing you've been hacked is one year. Can you afford to let an intruder roam your network for that long? Can your company weather the fallout when this comes to light? Black Hills Information Security can find the bad guys in your network and train you to do it yourself. Email consulting at blackhillsinfosec.com to find out how a hunt teaming engagement can help you find a persistent threat in your network. Has your network been breached? Cyber Reason can help you answer this question. Cyber Reason products hunt for threats within your network and eliminate them in real time. To Cyber Reason, real time means within seconds. Founded by former military hackers who don't play by the rules, they've built this experience into their platform. Harness ingenuity and imagination, not just code, to defeat attackers. Cyber Reason, disrupt the adversary and let the hunt begin. Endgame automates the hunt for both known and never before seen adversaries in enterprise networks. Built on unique knowledge on the adversary's tools techniques, and tactics, Endgame's centrally managed agent prevents, detects, and responds to advanced adversaries in the earliest stages of the kill chain without prior knowledge. Endgame, automate the hunt. Yeah. Welcome back, everyone, to Paul Security Weekly for the technical segment. Quick announcement, the first B-Sides in Uganda is happening. B-Sides Kampala, October 14th through the 15th. CFP is open until July 15th. They're looking for topics on network and web application security, innovative attack and defense strategies, malware analysis, biometrics, and evolutionary computing robotics. And my comments about that last week, besides Kampala being potentially postponed until next year, was incorrect. Okay. I received a uh, um, regular communication with one of the folks that is running the event. Gotcha. And, uh, he had let me know that, and then things change, and it's back to normal. And back to normal. Back to, for the mostly normal. Back to bonus points for bringing an actual robot. Visit besidescompala.com. Submit your talk today or tomorrow after you've thought about it a little bit. So, but, but bring your robot. But bring your robot. Justin Henderson is here with us. He's going to be talking about reverse analyzing attacks for detection. Justin is a passionate security researcher with over a decade of experience in consulting. He's a SANS instructor and has had multiple opportunities to work on government contracts specializing in network monitoring systems and incident analysis. He's had extensive experience in the healthcare industry. Justin is the 13th GSE to become both red and blue SANS cyber guardian, less than 20 in the world, and holds over 50 industry Certifications. You should put those all on a business card, dude. That'd you be should. awesome. <laughs> it's like point oh point oh two font or, or wrap to the back. The email signature. That's what yeah. You email all signature. Of all of it. Spell them all out. The the, the never ending email signature. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> you need to do yeah. it now. What's going on, Justin? Not much. Not much. <laughs> and you're you're you, in you, your you your can car. He's, yeah, he's you can tell he's passionate. He's in the shagging wagon. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Are you in your car? Are you just a random car in the parking lot, or? Ah, I just pick something random. You know, I security you. never stops. We'll do a little bit of physical pen testing while we're here. You, it looks like you chose something with uh, TV monitors in the in the back. It's nice. Yeah. Good choice. Good choice. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, tell us what you mean by uh, reverse analyzing attacks for detection, uh, and what problem you're trying to solve. Yep. Yeah, so. I'm the course author for the new SANS SEC 555, SIM with Tactical Analytics. Yeah. And uh, part of that course, I needed to do a lot of, uh, let's say, concept proof of concept testing. I needed to do different detection techniques and verify they work. And the best way to do that is just run lots and lots of manual pen tests and see if you can catch them. Um, and when I did this, the strangest things started to come to me that the uh, Many of the attacks we state can't be detected can be caught with just basic logs, like security products not included type of thing. Um, so when I say reverse analysis, really, I'm just talking about doing normal pen tests, such as with uh, Metasploit Framework, uh, Mimi Cats, simple reconnaissance, and then kind of doing a before-after snapshot and then seeing what you can catch. Gotcha. So. 
So how does so, that work exactly? Tell us. We want to yep, learn all so, about it. So basically what I'm doing, I'm running a uh, open source, what they call an elastic stack. Basically just think uh, collecting Windows logs, IDS logs, it, just any kind of data. But primarily we'll say flow data, network IDS, and Windows logs. And what I'm doing is looking at normal, basically no attacks going on. Uh, and then I start running attacks like uh, pass the hash, pass the token, um, maybe some actual exploits. Uh-oh, someone just unplugged his internet. No, they just put it on pause. <laughs> maybe he, did. he just got busted. <laughs> he did. My, my... Like... Am I still here? Oh, you're back. You're back. It's like watching okay. porn buffering. <laughs> oh, sorry about that. Uh, and so I was saying, why they a built lot of the PowerShell internet. attacks, just with everything being PowerShell nowadays. Yeah. So, um, so just just kind of showing through some of these. Like, uh, let me share my screen here real quick. There we go. Ooh, screen share inception. <clears throat> right. A screen and screen. Oh, yeah. So um, kind of a really easy example. So one of the number one ways that uh, pen test goes on is you basically steal credentials and pivot mercilessly, right? Yes. Heck, yeah. That, that I didn't expect was I was using Metasploit's uh, PS exec module. Uh, very normal use. You get credentials, whether it's a hash or, or clear text credentials, plug them in and log into the next box. Um, well, when I monitor these, so let's take this, the top red squares versus the bottom red squares. The top red squares are normal. So this is a Windows logon 4624 event. Um, normally, you have a key length of 128 and you have a valid Windows workstation name. When I monitored this using PS exec, I get a key length of zero, and then I get a random workstation name. Um, so right off the bat, something that everybody's using, uh, there's a clear distinction that it's not normal. Hmm. So, uh, and I'm sorry, so which, which, so which attack were you running that generated this log? PS exec. This is just... Yeah, this is just Meterpreter PS exec. Okay, gotcha. Yep. So, and, and of course, um, and Eric talks about this. I saw that Eric's in there. Uh, okay. Randomization. Many of our attack tools are repetitively, repetitively using random strings to evade uh, security products. Um, it's kind of the, you know, we stand up a defense, they find a way to go around it. Uh, but in this, this aspect, it actually gives... Uh, quite a bit of a tell. Uh, for example, NPS exec, the workstation name. If I were to log on to the same workstation three times, it's going to generate a random workstation name every single time. It's the way the tool's built to do it. Uh, yeah, the same. You know, the other thing that's really cool um, is that it um, the service creation generates a really random service name as well. <clears throat> yep. So, uh, service name um, on the same, even the same token. So we're still even talking the same uh, chain of attack. Uh, yep. The X509 and SSL certs, same thing. There's uh, randomness generated within this. Um, so that's just a, and again, it's a strength for the attackers. But in this sense, if you know about it, it actually becomes the weakness. Hmm. And, and if they try to not be random, that now makes it easier for the security products to pick them up. So kind of the, the catch-22 back and forth, the, the race against good and evil. <laughs> so nice. and part of that, so that's great and all, right? You see workstation name with a random name. You know, what the heck do you do with that? Um, and this is where Mark Baggett actually wrote a tool called freak underscore server. Yep. And, and I'll actually show you this. Now, so did he, he first... did he write that in Perl or was that? <laughs> <laughs> Quick story. So... Uh, but Mark, uh, Mark was sitting in uh, Security 511 with Seth teaching, and Seth and I have tried to tackle this challenge for a long time of how do you detect randomness. We call it high entropy names. Yeah. And a lot of people like randomly generate the name, and people are like, oh, calculate the Shannon entropy, and there's a Unix command called ENT that does that. Mm. The problem is if you're generating a name that's uppercase, lowercase number, 
that's 26 plus 26 plus 10. <coughs> out, of, out of ASCII, 62 out of 256 <coughs> is not high entropy, so they don't pop Shannon uh. entropy. And me and Seth were looking at this, and we kind of kicked the tires, and it seemed like an easy thing to do to start coding, and suddenly it's yes. not easy yes. anymore. I, that happens and, to me pretty much every time. Exactly. I it's, 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 <laughs> it seems so obvious. And then... Me and Seth talked about it, and, and Mark uh, was extending um, um, his class 573 from five days to six days, looking to put, it was a pure uh, pen test course before. Yeah. He was looking to add some more blue team elements, and Seth's like, hey, Mark, figure out this entropy thing, because me and Conrad looked at it, and we can't, and like, 15 minutes later, here, freak.py, <laughs> and, then, and then it works. It's just awesome. And then, and then of course, you know, Justin Henderson tries to run this, you know, at 100,000 events per second or something, and, and the Python script's falling down. We're like, how about a service, Mark, 50 minutes later, freak service. So, yes, <laughs> it works. Exactly. There's the backstory. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So, and, and just seeing how, and the, and the other beautiful thing with this is you can build your own frequency tables. Yep. So, uh, you have a global SOC, you're collecting logs from all around the world, you can actually load up different um, frequency analysis tables per geographic region. It's hmm. kind of cool. So, like, here, here's an example of how easy this is. You basically just Python load it up, pick a port to listen on, and a frequency table, and then your sim is how I'm using this. I'm just showing a manual use case. Um, it just submits strings to it, such as google.com. Then boom, it kicks out a, a number. So using this combined with your logs, um, you can handle millions and billions of events, and now we can do things like the service name, the workstation name, the SSL certificate fields, X509 fields, at scale looking for these random uh, values. So, so we that, just pipe, that's do a, you just pipe the logs directly to the port? Yeah, and it spits out yeah, a yeah. number. Mm -hmm. Nice. And, and yeah. based on the number, you can tell whether it's something like he mentioned, you can, any source, you feed it a corpus of like the Alexa top million, I guess the Cisco top million, or, or names found on Windows services, or EXE names found on whatever, you know, and whatever corpus you feed it, it'll tell you how likely or unlikely that that, that combination of, of letters is. Oh, I see. So you can feed it like, like the French dictionary or the English dictionary or whatever. And so if you're chasing down Windows service names, grab a list of all the real Windows service names, feed it that, and then you, you give it a string, it'll spit you out a number. How likely oh, is I that see. a Windows just service? Give it a string. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And out comes a number. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Got it yep. now. And this this works amazing. Good lord. Well. So you like, could you, he creates them you could use for pretty much anything. Anything. How likely is this string to exist in this universe of, of things I already gave you? Right. It's wow. powerful. Yeah. Wow. Uh, yeah, domain names. That has a lot of DGA. Yeah, it's, no, it, it, yes. it's groundbreaking. Uh, 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 Justin has already taken all his DNS resolution, every name that's resolved, and fed it into this thing. How likely is this name to exist in the Alexa or Cisco now top million? And, and based on how likely or unlikely, have someone chase that thing down. It doesn't mean it's malicious if it's very unusual. Yeah. It means it's worth looking at, you know? Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Yep. It's powerful. It's, it's finding a bunch of needles in an eel stack. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And it's, uh, you know, I don't know, it's free. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And if I, don't, if I only have to look at 50 needles as opposed to a billion needles, right. that's, yep. yep, there you go. Yep. And he did all that in Pearl. It's amazing. <laughs> uh, yeah. oh, no, you're no killing problem. me, Paul. I'm teaching this stuff right now. You're killing me. <laughs> so, you're killing there's... me, Smalls. You're killing me. <laughs> so I'll, co I'll come back to this one. So the other thing is um, one of the things that we commonly see is PowerShells being used for everything. Yeah. Like you've got Mimi Cats over PowerShell. You've got PowerSploit Framework. You've got Nishank. You have all these cool PowerShell attacks. Um, so I'm trying to find a way to catch them. And uh, as I looked into this, um, feel free to nail my feet to the floor, but I actually found a technique that works 100% of the time. Okay. You ready for this? Mm -hmm. We're ready. I'm, I'm <laughs> ready now. 100% <laughs> of the time. 100% of the time. It and detects Mimikatz 100% of the time? It detects any PowerShell attack 100% of the way time so far from anything anybody's ever sent me. Wow. Wow. Okay, you ready statement. for this? We're ready. And, and I, uh, yeah, yeah. Feel free to shoot me. You know, kick me off the show. That's all fair. <laughs> <laughs> we'll let our I've listeners the... Be, be the judge of that. You're among, you're among right. friends. That's right. Yes. So I've got all these small techniques that work really well, which we can come back to, but I'm just going to go straight to the chase. So right here. Uh, when you turn on PowerShell module logging or transcription logging, um, it records every time a function's called. So... Like, for example, 
uh, if I jump on this IT box and I run test connection, if I go into the logs, I'm going to see, let's see here, right here, test connection. Mm. So, so what I did is I built with a free elastic stack. I invoke this command at log time. And what it's doing is it's extracting every single PowerShell command that being used. Uh, and from that, you just simply dump to a CSV file. And then you turn around and throw it right back into the log system. And you say, anytime I see anything that's not one of these, alert. So it's basically whitelist detection for PowerShell commandlets. And so, for example, Mimi Cats over PowerShell will generate at least 100 functions that would not make your whitelist, such as invoke-dll. And the amount of effort to implement this is significantly less than a true application whitelisting solution. One, you're not blocking anything. And two, you're only detecting new commandlets or functions as they're used. And since it's going through logging system, you can be like, well, except I'll ignore my IT folks or the development folks. I mean, you can filter the heck out of it. Uh, and in my experience, if you spend one day, you turn on logging, log everything you have today, go ahead and stop it, and then put this in place by exporting all the modules that got used, uh, it's easy to maintain, and I have yet to find a PowerShell attack that w does not rise to the surface with this level of detection. Awesome. What what if there's a Mimikatz attack on the day that you run the baseline though? Oh yeah, then you're it's going to be part of the whitelist. <laughs> totally. Okay. I mean, that, that's that's totally valid. Um, it's not perfect, you know. but damn near perfect. E exactly. So, yeah, I'm sure there's <laughs> false positives, right? Something else runs. Well, invoke well, DLL is probably not a commonly used right. PowerShell function. Right. So, well, and, and so the false positives you're going to get with this is, uh, for example, I, I'm a very big PowerShell guy. So if I'm writing a new script, I'm going to build a new function. It's going to log it. There's your false positive. Mm. But I, I also know that that's so simple. Plus, it's logging who did it. So I could see Justin just invoke this new command called whatever. Uh, and it's very easy to you know, either add it to the whitelist or be like, hey, man, what are you doing? Nice. So, Justin, uh, which version of PowerShell? Is this PowerShell 5, the logging it has? Uh, do you need so... so this is the beautiful thing. You can do this with PowerShell 3. Wow. Um, you can do it with, so 3, you get module logging, which is extremely chatty. But that's actually what this is right here. This is module logging. Uh, also works with transcript logging as well as the script block logging, which is version 5. So Windows 7 had PowerShell 2, was 3 Windows 8. When did um, PowerShell 3 begin? Three, uh, I'm pretty sure three came with Windows 7. Uh, I mean, it started with two, but you could upgrade to three on seven. Right, got gotcha. you. Where's Carlos yeah. when you need him? There you go. <laughs> but, 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 yeah. you're, um, but, but Justin, you're, you're better off with script block logging, um, to state the obvious, right? I mean, you got it. Five is obviously the best, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Should, everybody should be going at this point to PowerShell 5.1. Like absolutely, no, no questions yeah, asked. I mean, I, I, I've, uh, I invariably um, advise all my customers just, just don't waste your time. Do script log logging, go to five, and then you can leverage the data from there. Yep. Absolutely, totally. That's pretty but awesome. Approach. Good stuff. But you're worried about false positives. You still could <clears throat> combine it with other easy techniques, such as just looking for incredibly long command line lengths, like this. So. Uh, that would be if you invoked it from the command line versus a script, because uh, malware is way more likely, or like the uh, the bash bunny, the rubber ducky, all the keyboard emulations and stuff yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those are going to so have you gonna, extreme... I, I got a question for you. What are you going to tell the customer that comes to you and says, so, hey, man, that's awesome. And, you know, I'm going to pretend you're a consultant for a minute. I, I don't know. That's probably not too much of a stretch, right? What, what are you going to tell the customer that comes to you and says, hey, man, that's really awesome, but I got 100,000 endpoints. How the hell am I going to log all that stuff centrally? Yeah, yeah. so um, what I typically do with that, there's two, two methods I like to do. Uh, one is Windows event forwarding, which, to be honest, in this scenario is probably not a good idea. Um, right. The reason being, if you were to run the PowerShell version of Mimikatz with module logging, 
it generates, I believe last time I did it, it was like 8,667 logs. <laughs> from, 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 wow. one, from one station, from, right? From one station. Wow. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, if you do if you do transcript logging or uh, the block text logging, it's less, but it's still a lot, right? Um, so my preferred method, but it's it's hard for some organizations, is I like to put a log agent on the system, such as um, NX Log. Uh, it's got a it's free. Uh, even if you were to do an yeah. enterprise edition, it's like five thousand dollars for unlimited agents. It's wow. ridiculous. Wow. Um, and what I'll do is I'll take that same whitelisting technique we just did, co- covered. And I'll build it into NX log. Don't send any logs over that are PowerShell that match um, the whitelist. So there now, you effectively, yep. you're saying don't send me anything unless I want to see it. Uh, and that that kind of alleviates the pain where people say, "Well, I can't collect logs on desktops and servers." I mean, I'm sorry, but that's utter bullcrap. And most attacks happen on the desktop. Mm. Uh, so I like to use this because my, my process here is collect key event IDs from running reverse analysis like we're talking about uh, and just filter everything out except for those and even then filter under certain circumstances like the whitelist. So don't zero EPS unless I care about it, like new service creation. That's very simple to say. Ignore all my whitelisted stuff. Just send me over the ones I've never seen before. Yeah, you know, I think I think I love NX log. By the way, I'm I'm completely on board with what you're saying. I think that's the right way to do it, and uh, it's a good good solution, and it's configurable, and and it gives you an immense amount of power to 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 filter down the fire hose of events, which is what you need to do. Coming to a yep. blue team challenge near you. <laughs> Slash me looks at Eric Conrad. Yeah, huh? <laughs> that's right. Yeah, exactly. That's right. Yeah. So, so the the other thing just to throw out with that is that's kind of interesting. So. Then you, of course, have uh, locations that are extremely anti, you know, additional agent. Um, and I totally get that, you know, whether it's politics, resources, uh, concerns over crashing stuff, I don't care. I get it. I get it. Uh, a different approach is actually to stand up a single NX log enterprise edition on each, uh, we'll call it regional or major location. Uh, and you can actually simulate a Windows event collector. And then do all the drops there before you send it over your internet pipes. Yeah, almost like a almost like a hub and spoke kind of topology, right? You collect it and filter it at the the central collect at the distributed well, collection points, and then distribute. Push it on. Yes, yes, at the distributed collection points, and then put it on. So, yeah, yeah where there's a will, there's a way. <laughs> One of the things about pre-filtering, a lot of the sim vendors are guilty of this. So like, you know, you shouldn't or you can't pre-filter. <laughs> send it all to Arc Sites, send it all to QRate or whatever. And they're doing this, one of the reasons they do this is to make more money because the more events you send, the bigger SIM you need and the more Oracle licenses you need. And so most of the SIM vendors will say don't pre-filter, but I know I believe and Justin believes pre-filtering is the bomb because yeah. if you don't pre-filter, you're probably not going to send any desktops. You have 100,000 desktops, 50,000 desktops. So I love these solutions that pre-filter, ignore the white list of services, send the things we've not seen before. You can handle 50,000 desktops if it's only brand new services that aren't whitelisted. The SIM vendors don't want you to do this, but when you, you roll your own, with elk as justin has you can do whatever you want well and i think the sim vendors want you to buy more stuff obviously but they also want that level of control sure because a lot of them do i guess you'd call it like (coughs) mid log filtering right it's Mm -hmm. not pre they're taking in all the data but they're using their own logic to prioritize it so they're saying yeah this is like general noise like consolidate it and just store it over here and then they're processing. So they're doing what Justin's talking right, about. They're right. just doing it all in one system. Sure. Of course that comes with some interesting things like bandwidth and right. storage and all of that stuff. So right. Well the other thing is you gotta stay on it, right? I mean the other thing about pre filtering, so to speak, is the the fear of false negative, right? right. So you, right. you have to you have to be aware of what you're doing and be agile about it. Uh, otherwise you could lose badly. Sure. Yep. Yeah. And then there's the fear of performance issues, but uh, my thing is I found in most cases the pre-filtering actually improves performance, especially if you're doing encryption before you send it off. Yeah, I I, I think that's uh, that's an accurate statement. <laughs> <laughs> so okay, so uh, other things that I've seen, uh, just kind of the pen tester and me switching over to the blue teamer and me. Um, you know, you initially get a toehold on the network, 
you know, that reconnaissance phase that we often say blue teamers are screwed and can't catch. Uh, in my experience, there's a few techniques that I absolutely love. Uh, and, and I didn't create all of these. Some of them, uh, like for instance, in this, this screenshot here, Mickey pair, um, often attackers will go in and they'll look for like the domain admin account. The problem is they might do net group. They might do DS query. They might do LDAP. They might do PowerShell. There's different ways to find the domain admin membership and effectively any standard user or even a machine account on the domain is allowed to do this. So there's kind of that, uh, that myth that we can't catch this. So what he shows is we can just go into active directory and enable auditing on key groups and now any account that enumerates them, it cuts a log. Uh, and I found this to be significantly accurate in that once I'm on the network, if I'm trying to do reconnaissance and find key privileged groups like enterprise admins, schema admins, domain admins, uh, it's very difficult not to get caught trying to find the members of that group. It's interesting. It begs the question, what's the legitimate use case for enumerating domain admins? Sure. Yeah, and so and, and with dealing with, with the audits to create, I mean, it's typically going to be your IT folks, which, again, if you're doing this on the yeah. end of a sim, it's easy to filter out exceptions for those users. Um, or it's uh, LDAP services, such as you have a web server that is doing the... Uh, company phone listing and directory listing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, but there's not a lot of valid use cases for the need to do that. <laughs> yeah. Cause it, is it Kerberos that does the authorization check, not enumerating who's in the group through the directory services, I would assume, right? Like the check to see that I'm a, a domain admin doesn't, does that require like a directory service lookup? to see who's in domain admins, or is that more like a Kerberos ticketing thing? Uh, I, don't, I don't know if that's a ticketing thing. I think that's just a, I mean, because again, a, a standard user or even a, like if you break into an IS server that's using a computer account for network calls, you can actually yeah. do it with that. Right, right. Yeah, al almost anybody can, can enumerate things in the LDAP Correct. directory. Right. Uh, and that's really what's behind it. So um, yeah. the thing is, the question that's, that's being asked, I think that, ju that Justin's uh, um, getting at is, is it appropriate to do so? You know, is it normal to do so, right? And, it, and, it, and it's not really <laughs> normal to do so, and that's where I think people need to catch up. Yeah. I mean, even you hear, you hear the funny use cases of uh, pen testers broke into a printer. Printer has LDAP credentials. Uh, now they're querying domain admins from a printer. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Not normal. So the other one that I, another technique that I absolutely love is, um, and this one is so basic, I don't know why others haven't thought of this, is uh, just file auditing. So Windows, Linux, I don't care what it is. You can audit if someone accesses a file. So I thought about this, and I was like, well, what if I create a A folder and a Z folder, and either I mark them as hidden or I don't, it doesn't really matter. No one's supposed to hit them. So you, you exclude, you tell your antivirus engine, don't touch these folders. Maybe you push this out with group policy. And now all of a sudden, if I'm on your box doing a pen test and I run any automated recon tool against your hard drive, I'm caught. <clears throat> yeah, John Strain had a similar technique that created like a, an endless loop, essentially, if you hit a folder. It's like creating oh, I, a, a link to itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, th and that's awesome. Like Labyrinth does that with web servers, and yeah. his team did that, and that's great. And I'm not even talking that, though. The The endless loop is great because now you're slowing them down as well. I'm just literally talking, let them enumerate them, but just cut a log saying that file was accessed. Mm. Don't even don't even stop them. Don't even loop them. Just, just log it. It's a basic it's honey a token. Mm. Yes, yes. It's basically a honey token with files. But it doesn't even matter whether it's exfilled or not. The simple fact, even that a folder was traversed, that shouldn't have happened. You basically intentionally put in a situation that's not supposed to happen. Nice. And of course, you can only log, we're talking about the pre-filtering, right. you only log <clears throat> access to those folders, not every other folder. Right, exactly. Yeah, and you don't have to do this like for, uh, for those who don't have pre-filtering. 
Um, this is per file per folder. So you don't have, it's, you know, just a window setting or on Linux, you can do uh, like audit D. Um, it doesn't have to be pre-filtered. It can just be set up. Uh, to only spe- audit, yeah, to only audit your, your honey, honey folders? Honey yep. folders. And- and could be even you could exclude certain users directly with the auditing, both Linux and Windows. Nice, nice. Yeah, Paul, I hear you've got a bunch of honey folders, but they're completely different. That's totally, <laughs> <laughs> totally. They're fully all your honeys. What's <laughs> what's in those folders is totally, <laughs> totally different. Yeah, but you might want to know when someone else accesses. That's them. Right. yes, yes. You need to be <laughs> audit D to tell you. Yes. I audit. I audit D. <laughs> Configure audit D to monitor those yes. folders and exclude myself. Yes, <laughs> or not. Or not. <laughs> or not. <laughs> Whitelisting your own access to your honey folders. That's that's important. That's important. Yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. All right, Justin, we get time for like like one more, dude. <laughs> one more. All right. I'll let, I'll let you guys pick. So we can talk uh, Honey, uh, Mimi Cat's Honey Token. Yeah, let's or do that. Or we can talk uh, Domain Stats, which is being able to do a bunch of tricks around DNS. Yeah, that's on the board. Let's do the first one. Yeah, way, <laughs> way sexier. Way sexier. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> Paul, Paul just wants some more honey. <laughs> I, want, I want to talk about honey. <laughs> he got him on this uh, track. He's not getting off. Come on. Uh, all right, so Mimi Cat's Honey Token. So Mimi Cat's is used in pretty much all attacks. It's very, very common. Um, so there's been talk about creating a fake... Honey token account, but the problem is, how do you do so without creating real privileges, right? You don't want them stealing an account that literally has access. So Mark Baggett posted a article on the Internet Storm Center that you can use the net.exe command to create any user on any domain with any password, shove it in memory, and it not actually have any pr- privileges whatsoever. Hmm. So I played I around love, with this. I love this post. I love this post Mac did, by the way. That's awesome. It's it's fantastic. So uh, so what I did is like, well, I wonder if I could do group policy as a logon script and push this into every single machine in an environment. And it turns out that's extremely easy to do. Wow. So you push this out there. You can even set it to your domain. So like in this case, I did uh, sec555 as domain. Just assume that's, that's the company. I uh, used the built-in administrator account for the domain. And then you set a password like super ultra secret password that cannot be hacked. You know, a little bit of enticement going on there. Um, so now Mimi Cats gets ran. Here's the output. You see that password. You see that user. Is it a real user? No, no, it's not. Uh, so if they take this, they turn around and use it. Uh, now you can catch that uh, again with just basic logs because you shouldn't see that account being used from anyway. certain directions. That's or any, that, ideally, that's, any. That's a lot of what Javelin Networks is doing. It's uh, an example of one of the things that Javelin Networks is doing. A sponsor of ours that's running tech segments specifically in this topic. Sure. Um, yeah. Yeah. They you use know, some you, like you, the, artificial intelligence to create a lot of fake stuff more than just accounts inside of your domains when you access them there. Uh, they have blocking capabilities with this, but this is kind of like the... Uh, straw man solution sure. to you know to that to do some of uh, what they're doing, which I think is a highly effective method for catching attackers and penetration testers alike. Exactly. You know what's really awesome about this, as uh, as Justin was just saying, it's really really easy to do. You just yeah, put one is. flag right. on the net command, and you're caching a credential in memory. It's freaking awesome. <laughs> Is very okay. cool. Anyway, Thank now you, you, you hope that someone <laughs> checks that log and, and chases it down before, and you hope that there wasn't real administrator credentials in memory, because likely, as Larry and Joff and John and all the other pen testers say, like the customer walked out of the room and you know when they came back, like we had domain admin. That's as fast as it takes. So that's one of the the limitations with with this. Yep. It's great for detection, but you have to be actively looking because yeah, domain yeah. admin happens like that. You, you don't know how many times me, you don't know how many me. times they've been. Oh, well, some of our guys. Tyler is famous for this for whatever reason. Has spent uh, doing a, a red team exercise and spent so much time being so silent, getting in that they are literally leaving the engagement to head to the airport to go home and pop DA, at, DA in the cab on the way to the airport. <laughs> <laughs> it's happened three times. <laughs> three times. I, I, I gotta, I've got to ask uh, Justin a leading question, um, and that is um, when you use Mark's technique to cache this credential in memory, 
and then you subsequently run Mimikatz, is there any way for the attacker to know that's a fake credential? And this is a leading question, obviously. Great question. Yeah, because it's uh, not going to yeah. work, right? So it's, it's not going to work, for one thing. Um, but there is. If you actually analyze the Mimikatz output, you could identify uh, somewhere in there that this is effectively not a... It's not real. Mm. Uh, and actually, Benjamin Delpy has an article, because right. when Mark came out with this, he's like, hey... Well, I could just blah, 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 blah. And, like, and that's true. But if you're a flyby of the seat of your pants pen tester or you're doing automated tools or whatever. Yeah, most malware is probably not yeah. going to pick up on that. Right. I, would, I yeah. would venture to guess. Right. Yeah. But, but there, is, there is a way to visually, I mean, you got to look for it. But yes, yes, you can. But that's still a good thing for people to start. Of if course. you're seeing success with this, I would pursue Javelin networks or similar techniques inside of your network and build upon this, Justin. So I think it's mm -hmm. a, an extremely valid thing to point out for people to start looking at because I truly believe that this is the way that we need to start uh, and continue to defend networks today uh, based on the mess that Microsoft has handed us with Active Directory. No one disagreed with me there. Okay, no. that's good. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> it's a feature. <laughs> Justin, thank you very much for appearing on Security Weekly. I loved the technical content in this segment. I thought it was awesome and very timely. And very creative and innovative. Justin, thank you so much. Very, very much. Appreciate thank it. You. Thank you. With that, we take a short break. Come back with security news. Stay tuned. Don't go anywhere.